Catherine Burnett, our next speaker, earned her art history doctorate at the University of Michigan and is currently associate Pref professor of art history here at UC Davis. Uh, on a personal note, as the librarian responsible for the relevant fields that she works in, I work closely with Professor Burnett and her students. I can attest to the fact that she's both a dedicated and popular teacher and an indefati indefatigable researcher. Her first book, Dimensions of Originality, Essays on 17th Century Chinese Art, History, Art Theory and Criticism, was published in 2013 by Chinese University Press. Um, Oh, she's also the founding director of the Global Tea Initiative and the force behind this symposium. She will now present on reconstructing Vietnam's early tea culture through teapots. Thank you. What Dan didn't share with you was that um, often, Often what happens is that I'm trying to find something and I can't and so I write Dan and say help I'm stumped again, please help and uh, Dan always comes to my rescue and finds exactly the article or the book that I desperately need and makes sure that I get to have it and that's one of the great benefits of being here at UC Davis and in the UC system because um, the library is phenomenal, and because the library is phenomenal, we get great librarians, and the great librarians love to help us, and we therefore love our librarians. Um, so, my talk today is Reconstructing Vietnam's Early Tea Culture Through an Investigation of Teapots. So, the theme of this event is on sustainability and preservation, but uh, I will take an art historical uh, perspective, um, and uh, I'm trying to understand early Vietnam's culture of tea. Uh, Vietnam has a culture of tea now, but did it always have a culture of tea? So that's one of the motivating questions. The answer you'd think would be a natural yes, but in fact what happens with this kind of project um, was that uh, I come up into some funny mysteries and some funny stopping points that make you pause and go, hmm, what is going on? So, so um, this is a new project for me, uh, pretty much inspired by the fact that I wanted to do something um, new uh, and that would be uh, relevant to the GTI in my research. And so this is a new project and it's still in its preliminary stages. But I found enough early evidence to be able to share some interesting information with you. And uh, maybe you'll give me some new questions or information to help me move forward. <clears throat> So this uh, project engages in a border studies approach uh, or studies of border crossings. Now, this is something that the Association for Asian Studies, uh, which is the major uh, professional organization for professors and scholars of Asian studies across the board, um, uh, go to and it's a leading force in the academic uh, scene. And so by pushing this, they've been pushing this way of thinking and researching for the last maybe decade or so. And the benefit of this is that by learning about, it's the comparativeness. So you can learn an awful lot in depth about one. And as a Chinese a, a scholar of Chinese studies or sinologist, I love working about, on China. I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy right there. But when you do a comparison between two different things, you learn more about each one in ways that you wouldn't be able to gather individually. So, uh, so I decided to accept the challenge of this approach, uh, which is new to me, actually, and consider China's visual traditions from outside of China. So I thought it might be interesting to focus on teapots because actually I just love teapots. It's just an excuse to look at more teapots. <laughs> and, um, but my official excuse is because it's a better way for me to understand China, its tea culture, and how it spread. So through these things, I wondered what could we learn about China vis-a-vis -vis its southeastern border states. So by comparing Chinese and Southeast Asian teapots, especially between the years 1300 and 1700, roughly, at, uh, would we find similar or different tea cultures? 
This comparative study of teaware gives me the opportunity not to go down the well-worn path of the great land and maritime trade routes that were encircling the world uh, for tea and tea culture from China to other parts of East Asia, Europe, and the New World in the 17th century, but instead to go in a different direction, south and west into Southeast Asia. This made me realize that global issues could be considered on a more local or global scale. I decided to investigate the trade in tea and tea culture from China uh, and Southeast Asia, but starting with Vietnam. So one of the things that I'm starting to suspect is actually that uh, the production of ceramic wares um, in Vietnam at this time had a global impact in ways that we're, we never, be, never ever anticipated, but that's another study uh, later on, but this is where I'm starting to think. But in any case, um, I want you to know that I am no, in nowhere near an expert on Southeast Asia or Vietnam studies. M my training is in China. Still, that expertise is not irrelevant. Um, as the Metropolitan Museum of Art curator John Guy points out, intensive comparative study between Vietnam, Vietnam ceramics and contemporaneous Chinese ceramics must be addressed. Doing this permits informed analysis of style, which draws on the extensive body of knowledge of Chinese ceramic development, especially relating to problems of dating. So, moreover, he says, the ethno-historical knowledge of Vietnamese culture is little examined. So, yay, um, I can tell you that's helpful to, to I, the, 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 the scholars of Southeast Asia think that this kind of study would be a useful thing. But with my preliminary research, I can tell you even less has been done on Vietnamese tea culture than, and teaware before 1700. So, um, and um, moreover, Vietnamese ceramics in particular are grossly understudied. So I'm really happy to realize that, in fact, this project turns out to be a really good idea. Um, so, so I thought this was going to be an easy project. I was going to go to the library, which we love, and get a bunch of books on ceramics from China and Vietnam, uh, find the teapots, and explain the evidence, and be done. But I discovered otherwise. Usually, I start with a question, and then try to answer the question about it through interdisciplinary evidence. In this project, surprisingly, the visual evidence just didn't show up. In fact, spoiler alert, in my examination of all the books on early Vietnamese ceramics in the UC libraries, including those I could get through interlibrary loan, and then my trips to museums, including in Vietnam, and then my trips to galleries, including in Vietnam, and also in private collections there, the only teapot that I have found from this early period that was made in Vietnam is on the screen. It's in the collection of the Than Long Imperial Citadel, Hanoi. It was excavated from this imperial palace. And even for this one vessel, I'm not really confident that it's even a teapot. So, why teapots? How can teapots be so informative? The answer is complicated, and it's a relationship of why a teapot equals when a teapot equals what a teapot is. And then from it, that, we can ask where a teapot equals what is tea culture. Because ceramics is a utilitarian art, form follows function. That's one of the fun things of studying ceramics. It's a really direct form, function, must match. Since we're talking about teapots, uh, so we're gonna talk about uh, tea culture in China first, and this is pertinent, so I'm gonna give you a quick history of when teapot becomes teapot. So, steep tea had been one form of drinking tea in China since at least the Tang Dynasty, but it wasn't the most important form of drinking tea. Mixed or whisked tea powder ground from tea cakes was the norm, and the mixed tea was then served in tea bowls. So on the screen is a tea bowl and stand made of glass from the 9th century above, and then below is a tea mortar uh, dated to 869, made of gilt silver. These are luxury grade items from the Tang Dynasty. Here's a painting from slightly late, later of servants preparing, a mixed, uh, preparing to serve mixed or whisked tea. And the lower center 
let's see here, uh, this young man is blowing on the hot coals to heat up and boil water in this ewer, not teapot or even kettle, uh, while uh, uh, another servant over here is grinding tea cakes into a powder. Um, the powder is then uh, whisked in bowls, here's a scoop and whisk, and then served in these cups, on cup stands. Oops, sorry. So uh, even a little bit later, uh, here's a Song Dynasty porcelain cup and cup stand, uh, and a Ming Dynasty version of the same thing made of bronze for the cup and wooden cup stand. So what this shows us is that the tradition for whisked tea or mixed tea continued on into popularity in the 11th and 12th centuries, but, um, and even all the way up through at least the 17th century. So although by that point, whisked tea wasn't the dominant style of tea in China, it did continue. As we all know, <clears throat> whisk tea also became popular in Japan, as Paul Berry has just uh, told us quite a bit about. On the right is an example of a teacup and stand, but this time from Japan, from the late 18th and 19th century, and it's now in the Global Tea Initiative slash Institute collection, and we're grateful to the anonymous donor who recently made the gift, and you can go back during the break and take a look at that cup and stand. It's a beautiful example of uh, lacquered uh, and painted ware. Here's a, just a, to help you understand this is history. Uh, this painting helps us understand the process. It was done in the early 12th, late, late 12th and early 13th century. So here uh, is uh, uh, the, the uh, tea being ground into a powder, tea cake being ground into a powder, the powder being poured into a large bowl <clears throat> where the water that's boiled in a kettle on the brazier is then poured into a water ewer, which is then poured on top of the tea, which is then whisked and then served in the tea bowls. There you go, there. <clears throat> and so here are the tea bowls uh, separated, the bowl separate from the stand and the water ewer, uh, Song Dynasty examples in porcelain. Uh, and then again. So those are Song Dynasty teaware. So here's the kicker. By the late 13th and 14th centuries, steep tea became the com had become common throughout China. Not just whisked, but also steeped. Sorry. Um, so, and <clears throat> uh, in 1391, the first emperor of China decreed that, you know, cake tea was really, um, difficult to make, it was highly laborious, it wasn't fair to the workers, he himself uh, rose up from the worker laborer class, and so he decreed that really what he wanted as tribute to receive into court was loose leaf tea and loose leaf tea only. That was tribute grade tea, he would not accept cake tea at all. So what happened with that was that cake tea started to disappear, whisked tea started to disappear, uh, and steeped tea became the norm. Well, once you have a different form of tea as the norm, then teapots become a necessary object. And then the teapot shape starts to become standardized because up to that point, what's a teapot? It could be probably anything useful that you can put tea in. But uh, you start to figure out what's really going to make a better cup of tea. So consequently, we, it seems to me, as a beginning research in this, researcher in this area, that we should start to expect to find teacups, uh, teapots as teapots, at least as early as the beginning of the 15th century. Well, uh, so look at the examples on the screen. Uh, they're both datable to around um, 1402 to 1424 so the beginning of the 15th century. So what is a teapot? We're all familiar with the teapot shape, but basically from very early on, the prototypical teapot shape tends to look like this, squat and round with a flat, stable bottom, no foot, a short spout rising up uh, above the shoulder, up to the shoulder or perhaps above, uh, a loop handle at the back that pulls away from the vessel and allows for a hand to hold the pot without being bur the fingers being burned. That's an essential characteristic. Uh, a secure lid that won't fall off when you pour it over. And also a wide mouth that allows for the input and removal of spent tea. 
So uh, here's the vessel, uh, one of those vessels from the early 15th century on the left, and here's one from the early 16th century, actually date to bowl, uh, was excavated from the tomb of a eunuch uh, who died in 1533. Um, and it looks like we would think of a teapot, and up to re recently I thought of it as a teapot, but I think now it must be a tea kettle. And I think it must be a tea kettle, even though that shape is made into teapots now. <clears throat> uh, what it inherits from the Song Dynasty, if not earlier, is the loop handle above. And the benefit of having a loop handle above, remember form follows function with ceramics, is that you can lift it. And by lifting it, uh, it makes it comfortable for somebody standing next to a stove or brazier at this height to lift. And also, when by lifting it with the handle above, you would not, with a handle on the back side, you might burn your fingers from heat rising up from the source of the heat. Um, so it's a perfect uh, uh, solution for a water kettle, not a teapot. So when we go to Vietnam, and this little pot, I can now understand why the museum curators at the, uh, who put this on display just called it a pot. I might now suggest calling it a water or tea kettle, um, but uh, I, I can't now yet, I, I wouldn't now necessarily argue for it as a teapot. So this is the shape, though, that we're looking for in Vietnam. So now, um, understanding what we're looking for, why is it reasonable to expect to find teapots in Vietnam from this period? It's actually sort of, it, it, I just find it really fascinating. And there are a lot of reasons. First of all, as most of you in this room know, tea grows indigenously in Vietnam. Vietnam is what I call part of the indigenous tea belt. Uh, which I've drawn a line to indicate and suggest where that is, um, and from northeast India across Southeast Asia into southwest and southern China. So if uh, Vietnam is growing tea indigenously, it seems reasonable to expect that it would have its own tea cultures. It may not look exactly like China's tea cultures, but you'd think that it would have something to use those leaves. Um, but it also seems reasonable to over, that it would overlap, that the Vietnamese tea culture would overlap with China's. Uh, because, of course, Vietnam is right on the border with China, uh, um, and so borders are always porous. Um, you can, anyway, borders are porous. Uh, <laughs> I'll keep my politics to myself. Um, <laughs> Research shows that the Yunnan Sichuan area was exporting teas to Tibet by the 8th century and possibly as e even as early as the 3rd or 4th century. Later in the Ming, even more tea from southern Yunnan, that is even closer to Vietnam, was being produced and traded to Tibet, so going north. <clears throat> but, so, so, so we know there's trade going from that general area, why does it only have to go north, right? So why wouldn't it also go south? So like the Chinese Vietnamese myth holds that the divine farmer, Shen Nong, was the first one to discover tea. Well, Shen Nong is not a Vietnamese concept, it's a Chinese concept. So that already shows that the Vietnamese are absorbing China, aspects of China culture. So one of the things that is fascinating about tea in Vietnam today is that it's important to many people from birth to death. Every major right is celebrated with tea. When babies are born, they're washed in tea. When a couple gets engaged, they have a tea ceremony. Our daughter had that, her, our, our son-in-law um, was born in Vietnam and we experienced the tea ceremony. I didn't know enough to provide good tea at that moment, but I should ask them to do it again. We could try over. Um, but then when people die, the corpse is covered with tea leaves within the coffin. So obviously it's an important part of Vietnamese culture today. We can expect, therefore, that sometimes at least, <clears throat> the tea wear in practice of, the, of uh, Vietnam will be identical to that of China. 
Another reason why we may expect to find teapots in Vietnam is that unlike most of the rest of Southeast Asia, Vietnam has had a robust ceramics industry for millennia. And throughout the centuries, Vietnam has had ties, political, trade, and cultural with China, sometimes close, sometimes fraught. This includes during the Ming Dynasty and the, basically the period that I'm particularly interested in. During this time, when steep tea preparations dominated all others for the first time, envoys from Vietnam to China strategically displayed their knowledge of Chinese culture to the Chinese court as a diplomatic and state-preserving tactic. With tea culture in China taking elite forms, and the most elite being for steep tea, it only stands to reason that the Vietnamese envoy's understanding of Chinese culture must have included a solid grasp of Chinese tea culture in all its current fashions, that they would have had to understand the necessity of a teapot, <clears throat> not only but also. Back in Vietnam, Vietnamese artisans had to serve three months of every year working at the Vietnamese court. That would be the best of the best. There they learned to make the most up-to-date prestige objects, which therefore must have included teaware for the royal family. And then the way forces of prestige and desire work on society, we can reasonably expect that once back to their hometowns, these artisans would have continued making these objects in this mode, spreading imperial culture and Chinese style tea culture throughout the rest of Vietnam. Therefore, it seems reasonable to argue that Vietnam must have developed its own tea culture, both local and also Chinese style, and made its own tea vessels to suit these varying needs. All historical evidence supports this claim. The question remains, where are the teapots? In fact, what I've found so far is that there's lots of historical evidence, political, social, economic, but almost no physical evidence, no artifacts. Most of that seems to have been destroyed so far, but I'm just beginning. So what I'm finding is mostly an art history without the art. But what evidence there is suggests an even more complex story. Part of it surely involves the trade in ceramic ware between China and Vietnam. In the early Ming Dynasty, Admiral Zheng He's immense treasure ships carried soldiers, diplomatic specialists, medical personnel, astronomers, Jackie, uh, and scholars of foreign ways to central Vietnam, among other places further west. It can be no mere co coincidence that the site on Vietnam's eastern coast where Admiral Zheng He landed was Quy Nguyen, one of Vietnam's historically most important ceramic kiln sites. Back in China, porcelain produced in China's porcelain capital at Jingdezhen was often made in shapes and decorated with designs specifically suited to the usage and taste of this important Vietnamese market. As well, by the 17th century, teapots were being made for Vietnam at another of China's major teaware producing site, Yixing. In other words, China made Vietnamese style ceramics for Vietnam and at its most important ceramic kiln sites. What are these? Here are some early 18th century examples. Mostly white now, they were made at Jing De Den, uh, but originally they were uh, decorated with overglaze enamel colors and possibly also underglaze blue painting. They were found in a 1713 shipwreck, um, uh, but because they were uh, found in a shipwreck and underwater for uh, so long, the decoration has washed off. This little pot, which is so sweet, was made in 18th or 19th century Yixing, China for Vietnamese consumption. Um, this characterizes another aspect of Vietnamese aesthetics distinct from that of China. Unlike Yixing pots made for the Chinese market, the surface of this vessel has been burnished to a high sheen. This was appealing to the Vietnamese market. For zixia pots made at Yixing, uh, such as this one by this famous one, one of my favorites. Um, uh, Yixing pots are rarely shiny. Yixing pots for Chinese market uh, were rarely shiny. So, because China made Vietnamese style ceramics and teaware before 1700, it also follows that it would have used models from Vietnam to work from. 
So uh, where are those? And I see I've got five minutes, so I'm, I'm doing my best here. Um, let's see. Um, and there are already, take a look at these trade route maps, uh, Chinese merchants going in and out, um, and also other merchants going into the major cities. So probably the merchants would have been trading these ceramics. Okay, so I just want to move forward. Um, and it is well known that the Vietnamese were generally quick to produce their only own Chinese-style ceramics. So uh, uh, scholars of Southeast Asian art are aware of this, so I'm going to have to be working with them. So here's a rare Vietnamese hanging scroll, the triumphant return of a military Mandarin from the late 18th century in um, a Vietnam Fine Arts Museum in Hanoi. Uh, in this detail on the left, you can see the military mandarin pauses to share a cup of tea. Um, and if you look closely, even though the surface is abraded, there's the teapot and some tea cups. Uh, so you can see um, what uh, 18th, 18th, late 18th century style tea uh, sets were like. So what happens by the 18th century is the teapot shape stabilizes, with brewed tea and tea sets becoming commonplace. So, Again, where are the Chinese-style teapots made in Vietnam before this time? And again, why do I think it's even possible? Because of the physical ex evidence that does remain. Um, these wine pots and ewer shapes that are uh, basically Chinese-style and the Chinese uh, examples are inset on the screen were made in Vietnam in shapes very, very close. Similarly, these uh, teapot-esque shapes, maybe their wine pots, um, made, uh, were made in uh, Vietnam in these early periods and also do have Chinese prototypes. So those are uh, vessels for uh, beverages. But even non-beverage vessel, vessels were uh, understood and copied from Chinese models in Vietnam. Here's a pillow, uh, the Chinese shape on the left with the wide uh, rest for the head uh, with a pillar usually to hold up that rest and then some decorative motif on the bottom is shared uh, from China into Vietnam. And of course there are plenty of non-Chinese vessels uh, such as the water vessels on the left or the lime pots on the right that were specifically made for a, a Southeast Asian market. But other than this tea kettle shape, I found no teapots. Well, quite clearly, I've just scratched the tip of this iceberg. There's a lot of research left to be done, but it's a fascinating story and a fascinating search. So thank you for your indulgence. <laughs>